Okay, everyone, so let's check out the calendar here. And I just want to show you where we're at. And right now, uh, at the end of this lecture, you'll be able to do all of homework 23. The first problem actually covers material from the last lecture. And um, I encourage you to do these R bonus assignments. There'll just be two more uh, bonus assignments, one more R and one more uh, bonus survey. And um, let's see. Also, I should probably show you something else you'd be interested in. And <coughs> that is right here. You can click here for a great calculator. Calculator. So you can put in your exam one grade, your exam two grade, your homework percentage, and I'll have everything updated um, uh, by the end of this week, and the bonus percentage. And then um, it will be your anticipated bonus, because there'll still be a few things. You'll have to turn in the completed notebook, etc., and anticipated homework percentage. And then you can figure out what grade you need to get on the final, which is really just an exam three, what grade, uh, what you want, what your target grade is, what you really are aiming for, like a 93, I suppose, would be a straight A. A lot of people would be aiming for that. And then it will say what you need to get on our final, which is exam three. So you can play around with that, and I'll update all your grades so you can do a better job of estimating that. All right, so let us go to finish up uh, logistic regression today. All right, so here we ended, uh, we left off on page 206. And what we were doing before was interpreting the slopes in um, the, the log odds linear equation. That's what we were doing before. And now we're going to interpret the slope here for a binary predictor variable, OK? So uh, that's just a 0, 1 predictor. Remember, we're in logistic regression, our y variable is 0, 1. And now we're just saying, OK, what if we just had one binary predictor? So uh, continuing with our example, of, uh, the, we're predicting the log odds of getting accepted to medical school. And let's say the only predictor we had was gender, whether you're male or female. So here's where we got our um, logistic regression equation right here. And we just have one x variable now. So um, remember what the odds ratio was. It was uh, the increase in odds for a one unit increase in your x variable. So if you have a binary predictor variable, it's really easy to understand because for in this case, for example, gender, we're coding males as 0 and females as 1. So the odds ratio, as you go from x equals 0 to 1, a one unit increase, is just changing from males to females. And how that increases your odds, how that changes your odds, would be the interpretation. All right? So what's our log odds equation here? If we're just, just doing uh, uh, gender, we'd have the log predicted log odds is equal to, it's just the computer gave us these uh, betas here. And so it's negative 0 0.2231 plus 0 0.8109 times gender. OK? And gender is coded 0 for males and 1 for females. So what's the odds equation here? So our odds equation, we just exponentiate both sides, and we get our predicted odds is equal to e to the negative 0 0.2231 plus 0 0.8109 times the gender variable. All right, now, so what's the odds of getting into med school for males? So for males, from up here, Males are coded as 0, so gen g is equal to 0 for males. So what do we get? So our odds here are what? Our odds, our predicted odds, is for the males, is equal to e to the negative 0 0.2231, right? Maybe I should rewrite this as, maybe the whole thing would make more sense. So I'll rewrite this as e to the negative 0 0.2231 
0.31 times e to the 0 0.8109 times gender. Okay, those two things are equivalent. And so now, um, for males, we get e to the negative 0 0.2231 times e to the 0 0.8109 times 0, which of course is just 1. That's just 1. So this right here is 0 0.8. That's what the odds of getting into medical school for, for males is. And remember what odds is, because uh, we want the probability to. Odds is just, get to the odds to the probability, we just say what? 0 0.8 over 1 plus 0 0.8. And that's 44.44%. Okay, so probability is just odds over 1 plus odds. Any questions on that? So now let's do it for females. So for females, gender is equal to 1, and so we're going to get the predicted odds for females is the same thing, e to the 0 0.2231. But then, since females are coded for gender as 1, we're just going to multiply this 0.8 times this factor, which is our odds ratio. e to the slope is our odds ratio. And we get 1.8. OK? And so then the probability is 1.8 over what? Just 1 plus 1.8, which is 2 over 2.8. And then you see that the probability for females getting in is quite a bit higher. They have 1.8 times, whoops, that's, yeah, that's right. OK, so now, um, so what are the odds of getting into med school? Um, compared to females? Well, the odds are, it's going to be the odds ratio. It's this factor right here. The, uh, compare the odds, right? And let's just write this up here, because we've done this before. So the odds ratio, what we did last time, is e to the slope for whatever you're interested in. So in this case, the odds ratio is e to the 0 0.8109. That's slope right there, because we're talking about gender. And that is 2.25. So what that says is the odds for getting in uh, for females is 2.25 times higher. And you can see that right here when you compare the males and the females. You just multiplied by that factor. OK, so here it is. The factor is e to the 0 0.8109, like we've always done before. But it's very simple, in, which is 2.25. OK? And it's 2.25 times higher. Why? Because this is positive. The slope is positive here, right? If it was, if we coded it the other way, then we'd have, uh, if we coded it, uh, males were 1. Then as we went from, uh, and females were 0, then as we went from 0 to 1, we'd have a negative slope here. All right? So the female odds are, just all repetition, this is just the odds ratio, e to the 0 0.8109, which is equal to 2.25 times higher. So the odds ratio, it's a special case of our previous definition, right? It's just our previous de definition was for, uh, what was it for biological science score? We said as you increase your biological science score, by 1 for each additional point in your biological science score, e to the slope for that was um, our odds ratio. And here, as you increase from 0 to 1, that just means changing from male to female. So it's very easy to understand. OK? All right. So now, any questions on that? This is the same thing as e to the b1. All right. Now, 
We've already done problems like this, predicting one binary equation, one binary variable from another. You can think of it as um, a chi-square test for independence, like is getting into medical school independent of what sex you are. We've done that before. Or you could think of it as a two-sided Z test, is um, you know the pro percentage of uh, females getting into medical school um, different than the percentage of males getting in or not. The null would be it's the same. And we could do a two-sided Z test, we could do a chi-square test, or we can do logistic regression on this one. So let's think about this. Um, is gender independent of acceptance to med school? So we'll look at the output below. I did a regular chi-square test here, and I got this p-value of 13.96. Notice how we get just about the same chi-square statistic and p-values we did. Well, let's look what we got here. What we got here, I called it a chi-square, but this is doing it actually through maximum likelihood estimates and also, and not, um, and that deviance, this, this comes from, this 2.197, remember, came from that deviant analysis of deviance tables. It's like the sum of squares for model, the equivalent of that. It's distributed as a chi-square. So it's not exactly the same thing, all right? We'll talk about this more. Um, but it's not exactly the same thing, even though the degrees of freedom are the same and the p-value isn't exactly, but it's very close. And with large n, it's almost identical. All right? So, anyways, um, okay, so they're not exactly the same because, as I said before, logistic regression here uses likelihood method. See later in this chapter, and we'll talk about it again. But here, I, what I want to show you here is the odds ratio is the same. Even though this chi-squared is almost the same, you're going to get identical odds ratios, and it's a nice way to understand it. So from this table, compute the odds, okay? And the odds are, you know, P over one, uh, 1 minus P for females. So the odds, another way to think of this is the number of successes over the number of failures. So we can just look at this table, and we're looking at females. So we're looking right here, females. What's their number of successes? 18 got in. What's their number of um, not getting in ton? So it's 1.8. That's the same odds we got with logistic regression. I mean, it's the same as, remember, same as P over 1 minus P, because why? Because successes are really, it's really the P is successes over total. So that's 18 out of 28 over failure over total. It's the same thing. All right. Now, um, so how about for males? So males, you do the same thing. What are going to be the odds for males? So you look at males here. And what are their 12 successes to 15 failures? So that's 0 0.8 odds. And these are the same thing we got on the previous page. So the odds ratio is just the ratio of their odds. 1.8 over 0 0.8, which is equal to 2.25. And how does it compare? It's exactly the same within rounding error because remember what maximum likelihood does? We talked about it a little bit. For those of you who've taken other courses, it maximizes the likelihood of getting the data that you have. You're trying to think of a function that maximizes the likelihood. So for this example, it's just going to look at this data and maximize the likelihood of getting it. So these, it's going to give you the same exact estimates using it this way, doing it this way, and doing uh, the odds ratio, the same exact. You might have, uh, you know, you could get slightly different depending on how you round these. But so these slopes will be basically, will be in complete agreement. What's slightly different is when you do the p values and you, um, you're trying to, uh, that, uh, 
right here, why you get different p-values, is because this isn't really here, isn't really a regular chi-square distribution. It's uh, in the limit, those deviance, the deviance uh, for the model will be distributed as a chi-square. So this will be slightly different, but your, these are the same. OK, so I just thought that's a nice way to tie it together. Now, multiple logistic regression. OK, so for multiple logistic regression, what are we doing? We're just adding x variables. So we have multiple x's. That's what that means. So this means uh, multiple predictors, multiple x's, predicting one y. And the y is a 0, 1 variable, one binary y. So we're going to combine quantitative and qualitative. Uh, you can have quantitative and qualitative x's, but logistic regression has a binary y. All right? And this is exact, this is going to go really quickly. It looks like it could be hard, should be hard, but it's exactly the same thing we've already done. So we've already done this same exact thing with multiple regression. So the process of going from a single, a simple logistic regression to multiple is exactly, almost exactly the same. All right? So we've already, it's the same as before. And as before, the coefficients in the multiple regression are generally different. The only time they're not going to be different is if they're all independent of each other, if all the x's are independent of each other. But if you add, otherwise, when you add an x that's correlated with anything else, they're going to change. OK? Why? Because they indicate the out, because they control for the other variables in the model. So let's consider a multiple regression model including both BS and gender. Remember what we did last time. What we did last time was we had a simple regret logistic log odds regression right here on page 203, and we got this slope for biological science score, right? We did that. Now, and then we did the same thing we got a simple one here for gender. We got that slope. Now, it wasn't significant, but it's positive. Now, what happens when we add them both together? Now we're putting them both in here. So we have here's gender, and here's, now we have three parameters, OK? And what happens? OK. So why would I want to do this? This is actually motivated by a real example that we were doing a project in the class. And I was, after I, I was wondering, is, uh, this was a couple of years ago, if um, there was gender discrimination. I thought there probably was. I thought women might be discriminated against. So um, I was very surprised when I saw, no, they're favored here. Look at this. Look at this. Their, their probability of getting in is quite a bit higher in this data set that we were looking at. And it held up in other data sets. So I said, hmm. And then I thought, well, maybe it's higher because they're getting higher MCAT scores and they're getting higher grades. So I said, that might explain it. If we put those in the model, maybe we'd see that gender discrimination. So I, so I started, just put the I know there's lots of women in biology. That's a really important predictor. So I said, OK, I bet they get a higher score. And then our gender slope would go down. So notice how the slopes changed. They did change. Um, but did it go down? What was the gender slope before? I predicted it would go down because I know they're both positive predictors. They're both positive, you know, with y. And then I thought they'd probably be positively correlated with each other. But what does it mean now that it went up? Why are women even more favored than they were in the simple? And also, why is biological, why did that go up too? Anybody understand what happens? Why this is so? So we get this regression equation. Let's just look at this. Negative 17 
plus we have a higher slope. And here we also have a higher. So it baffled, you know, can you just think about it? What is this saying? This is saying this slope here that's higher than what we had before is saying that for the same biological uh, science score, if you take a male and a female for this, that have the same exact <laughs> score, the chances of getting in for a female are even higher than when you don't factor that in. So that must mean what? What does that mean? Yeah? That um, scores and gender are negatively correlated. Yes, that's what it means. They were positively correlated. These would both go down. This means that a um, female has an even higher advantage if you look at their biological science scores. And I was really surprised by that. So of course I added more variables and trying to get, and I tried to get more data. And this was a big project that we did as a James Scholar project. It was very interesting here at the U of I, trying to get data on this. Because this is taken from another place, this data. OK, so um, it, it was fascinating to me. You know, to, this is why statistics is really interesting. when. It, sort of objective data, and so, you know, we went through the whole thing and tried to figure out what's going on here. It was a lot of fun. Okay, so look at the equation. Who has the better chance of getting into medical school, M males or female, given the same biological science score? Females. Why? Because the slope is greater than zero. And gender is equal to one for females. So this gives you the odds ratio comparing E to that. Let's get that. What's the odds ratio for gender and what does it mean? So let's get it. We know this odds ratio for gender is going to be E to the slope for gender, which is equal to E to the 2.015, which is 7.5. What does that compare to? Let's compare it to before. With 7.5 here, it says 7.5. Compare to, we had, I even remember it now. We have e to the 0. Point, almost remember, 8109. And remember that was 2.25. So that was a big jump. So what does it mean? How do we interpret it? It means what compared to this one? It means that the odds of acceptance to medical school is 7.5 times higher. for females than for males, what? If you compare a female and a male who have the same exact biological science score, OK? So given the same biological science score. And this was a shock to me. I mean, it really was, because I fully expected it to go down almost to zero. I thought it was just because of that. So then I thought, well, maybe it's grades. Maybe it's other things. And so I put a lot of different things into the model, and it you know, looked at all the covariate correlation matrix. And it was, it's really interesting to do when you really care about something. And, um, but we found out that it seemed like there was a little bit of discrimination for women no matter what we did. For, I mean, against men and for women. But, you know, I'd have, to, I, I'd have to get a bigger data set and a more reliable, you know, I'd have to do a lot more research to say that for sure. OK, but anyway, that was our preliminary results. So now, what, what's the odds ratio for biological score and what does it mean? All right, so we can do the same thing. The odds ratio for biological science score, what does it mean? 
Well, again, we'll just take e to the slope for by a lot, and now we get e to the what? 1.66, which is 5.26. So this went up 2. You can compare that to what we got before, which I did compare to e to the, it was smaller, 1.276 that we previously got, which was 3.58. in the simple, the simple model, the simple log model, log odds model. Okay, that was on, you know, this is what we did before. So it's, it, that went up too. So what does that mean? It means what? that if you compare two people of the same sex, like compare two males, then biological science score is more important, more a stronger predictor. It, it has you have a stronger odds of getting in than if you can compare a, ma compare a male to a female. That's what it means. So the odds of acceptance to medical school, it's the same thing, is 5.26 times higher for each additional point on the biologic science score, given what? Given you're comparing two people of the same gender. Okay, so that's the idea, and now we can just do some, let's just make some predictions uh, using this odds ratio or thinking about it, okay? So, have you finished copying this? You're good? Okay, so now uh, let's look. First, let's just use this model to fill out this table here to make a few predictions. This is just plug and chug. Um, all right, so what am I doing here just to make sure you do this correctly? Okay, so gender for males, this is all zero, and here it's one. So that's just, we're just going to plug in either a zero or one here in their biological science score. So I did it for the first one. The second one, um, you could either multiply by e to the slope for gender to get this change in odds, but, or we could just, I think it's just simpler just to do it. So this is negative 17 plus 2.015 times one plus 1.66 times 10. So the only thing that differs is this is increased by that. And we get 1.65, and then this is the log odds, anti-log it, so you get e to the 1.65, which is 5.207, and then what's the probability? It's 5.207 over 1 plus that. Okay. So that's all we're doing, and I got 84. So what does this say? So it's 40% versus 84% in this model for somebody who got those scores, but it's going to change depending on the scores. Sorry, it just doesn't look right. All right, so now we can do this. Let's say they go, um, we'll just do one more. So negative 17 plus 1.66 times 11. So you can see comparing this to this, it's just going to be you're adding 1.66, which means you're multiplying by e to the 1.66. But we can just do it out here. I got 1.26, and that's e to the 1.26, which is 3.53. And so now you have 3.53 over 4.53. I don't think I have to keep going. I think you know how to do this, right? You're good with this, everyone? Yeah. Okay, so now let's just use, let's compare. What if you're comparing a female with a biological science score two points 
lower than a male. How do the odds of the female getting into medical school compare to the odds of the male getting in? How would we do that? Well, we could use this odds ratio, e to the 2.015. That's the advantage. A female, that's the advantage, the odds ratio. The female has over, just for being female. Because that is the slope right here. So we're just saying the odds ratio, we're just saying, okay, so that's just for being female. But now, two points lower than the male. So, e to the slope for biological science score, it's going to be lower. So she'll have a negative, negative 1.66 instead of positive, because she's one point lower. So this is for her first point lower. And then each, it's a multiplicative. E to the slope is a multiplicative change in the odds for each one point change. So it would be times another negative 1.66 for being lower. If it was higher, we'd say positive. So that's e to the negative 1.305, which is 0 0.2. So she only has a zero, so she has a lower odds, 0 0.27 times the odds for male. So the odds for the female are 0 0.27 times the odds of them. So she has a worse chance of getting in. But if she just has, um, so now, when is it the same? The odds of a female getting to medical school are the same as the odds of a male getting in when the female score has what compared to the male score? When do you think that is? How would you solve that? Certainly two points lower is too little. It's going to be higher than that. So what is it? So we'll just look at this. So for females, we can look at this equation here. The log odds are what? Negative 17. plus 2.015 times 1 for gender, plus 1.66 times the biological science score for the female. I'm just copying that and putting a 1 in here. And we want that to be equal to males, which are negative 17 plus 2.015 times 0 plus 1.66 times the biological score for males. Okay, so when these are equal, their odds will be equal. So we can, what can we do? We can just solve for this, right? That's 2.05 times zero. So now we just have this equation and we can just solve for it. So we can say 2.015 is equal to, just subtract that, 1.66 times the biological science scores for the males minus the biological science scores for the females. And then divide both sides by 1.66. And I got 1.214 is equal to the biological science minus, the, for males minus females. So females, so that, um, they'll have the same probability, the same odds, same log odds equation when the males score on the average that much higher than the females, between one and two. Okay, does that make sense? All right, any questions on this? So now, um, and we can add other variables to the model. It's kind of interesting. You can play around with this data set. It's on the, uh, on the uh, data program. You can add grades in, different things, verbal scores, whatever. But each time, make, make sure that, look at that correlation matrix and make, things, make sure things aren't too highly correlated. Okay, so. 
Our last chapter is just going to be doing inference for logistic regression. Inference, okay? And so we're going to uh, look at, uh, we're going to get p-values, and we're going to do uh, chi-square, z, and t, and not t-tests, chi-square and z-tests. All right, so it's nearly the same as for regular regression, but it's somewhat different. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say our null is that all the betas except, you know, the intercept are zero. That's our null model. And then our alternative is at least one of the slopes is not zero. So we're going to do the same thing for the overall regression test. And then if we find that this is significant, we are going to test the individual slopes. All right? But in ordinary regression, we used either a chi-square or an f-test for small samples. But in logistic regression, we're predicting counts. So we're never going to use f-tests. Why? Remember that whenever you're basically percentages, we're, we're predicting percent of the people who get into med school, or counts. Um, don't remember that we never use f test because when we, the mean, when we estimate a percent, it contains the standard deviation inside it, really. Remember, if you estimate a p value of percent, let's say it was 60%, then your standard deviation is the square root of 0 0.6 times 0.4, right? So you don't have an independent estimate. So it's just contained right inside that, so you don't have an unknown. You don't have, you don't have this, uh, unlike if you have numerical data and your mean has no information. You could have a mean of, uh, let's say, 60 on an exam, and that doesn't tell you what the spread of the scores were. So you have to get that from the standard deviation of your data. And that's where that SD plus, come, that's where all that stuff comes in with the, um, the, a different distribution, the T and the Fs. So there's absolutely no need, in fact, it's wrong, to ever use an F or a T for percent data. We saw that before, and this, if you think about it, this is always going to be estimating counts, percents. They're all zeros and ones. We're counting, you know, how many people got zeros, how many people got ones. Right? We're just counting those up. So our Y is always a count. So don't even think about in small data samples, you're not going to use an F or a T. Okay, so that's what I say here. Whenever you have counts, just remember this in general. Counts, you're never, ever. You either use the exact binomial distributions, right? The exact ones, or you normal approximations. All right. So that's unlike effort, which remember estimates standard deviations from the variation, not from the predicted mean itself. The probability distribution, I can't emphasize this enough. I don't know, this is really important. The probability distribution, including the standard deviation, is determined directly from the counts, when you have count data. Um, that's unlike FRT tests, which you remember estimate the standard deviation from the variation not from the predicted mean. It's from the variation in your sample. So our tests, our chi-square tests, are always going to be chi-square tests for logistic regression or likelihood-based analogs of chi-squared. They're not going to look like F or T tests. And the degrees of freedom is exactly the same. The number of the parameters in the model, minus one, that's the same as for chi-square. Right? Okay. And here, this too. So then when we do the individual slopes, in ordinary regression for small samples, we use that t-test, right? In logistic regression, logistic regression, we never use t-test for the same reason. We always use a z-test or chi-squared or likelihood versions of them. Okay. And so here we talked about this a little bit before that... Um, and it, I really strongly recommend that you read week 13 in our free R course because it explains it in depth. But the idea is that we minimize um, something called the deviance in logistic regression. And we get this, and, uh, you know, 
deviance analysis table that looks very similar to our NOVA table. And um, why do we use the likelihood procedure? Why? Well, think about it. Each individual point has its own value of x, right? And it's a 0 or a 1. So once we change it to a, you saw how we had to change it to a log odds equation, right? Otherwise, it was outside the bounds and predicted these crazy probabilities of greater than 1 or less than 0. So let's say we do change it to a log odds equation. So then why can't we do a least square fit on this log odds linear equation? So think about it. Each point has an observed log odds of either um, 0, if it's log, log, log of 0, or log of 1, which is either negative infinity or positive infinity. So minimizing the squared errors for the is, is just going to be fitting a bunch of infinities. That wouldn't work. So what you might think to do would be to take intervals and lump them together, right? And then you'd get the, um, that would give us like, you know, the probabilities, like, you know, but that wouldn't, still wouldn't do a good job except in the middle of the range. Um, it wouldn't really be able to uh, see differences between really um, events that are rare, okay? And we really want to pick parameters that give good estimates throughout the range of the data set. That's basically it in the nutshell. That's the idea behind it. And if you want to look at the math behind it, um, read this. All right. Now, so let's look at our output here, okay? So let's look at how, what we're doing here. And we've got all right, so here's our deviance. This is our analysis of deviance table. And this right here is what we're calling a chi-square statistic, even though it's really not. It's like a mod. You can, it's this is distributed as a chi-square statistic. You can use the chi-square curve when n is big enough, but it's really not calculated as a chi-square statistic. So it's this is distributed. It's not really the same statistic as how you calculate a chi-square. It's distributed as a chi-squared. And it's very, it's going to be very close to it, but it's not exactly the same. All right. So, and then the degrees of freedom, how many parameters do we have here? It's the same as we did before. We have these three parameters. We have a B0, a B1, and a B2. So that's our parameters, three parameters. And so these degrees of freedom here, right here, the degrees of freedom, it's the number of x's in your model, but we've been thinking of it as P minus 1. And that's where that 2 comes from. All right, so everything's the same. It's the same, it's very similar logic. It's the same idea here. Okay, and um, so now we want to test, so we have this fitted model, and we want to do this over, yeah, fit our sample, but how good a job under the null, if there was nothing going on, how likely would it be to get this big a chi-square or bigger? So our, it's exactly the same logic that our null hypothesis is that both of these in the population, sure, we see this in the sample. It fits our sample. But how well does it hold up in a wider population? So both in the wider population are actually 0. That's the null. And the alternative is no, that at least they're not both. Zero, which means that at least one, maybe both, of the be one one of these is not equal to zero. One of the two. So what are we going to do? This is given to us, so we're just going to compare what's given to us. We're going to compare the, the uh, given what we're calling a chi-square stat. equal to 29.33, three, 
we're going to compare that to the critical value, which is chi square. We're going to put a little star for critical value with degrees of freedom equal to 2 at, um, we can do it at 5%. Look, we can look at this and see this is huge. Remember, the mean of the chi-square distribution is going to be about its degrees of freedom, 2. This is so much bigger. So I'm going to compare it at a very small significance. I bet it's going to be at 0.1%. Alpha equals 0.001. And see what we get. So let's go to our table. Here's our chi-square table. Degrees of freedom, 2. Remember, we have 29.33. And look, 13.82. It's much bigger than that. So we're going to compare it to 13.82. So it's greater. We'll compare. This is greater, much greater. So what does that mean? It means we have this. Remember, it's all positive here. And basically, it's going to be shaped kind of like this. It never crosses. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but it never does cross. And we said here at about um, right here is the chi-square critical value. And that's, what's that? That's 13.82, and that's at 0.1%. So that means this from here on in is 0.1%. That's what that means, 0.1%. Okay, and what's our p-value? Our p-value our p-value, we're way out here. Let's say this is our chi-square stat. Our chi-square stat is equal to 29.33. This is 29.33. So this from here to here is 0.1%. We're going to be a lot less than that because we're only this part of it. I should make it so that's the whole thing is 0. 0.1% and we're there. So it's less than 0.1%. It's very hard to read that. I'm very sorry. It's less. This is 0. Point, so it's less than 0.1%. It doesn't even make it easier, but I'm telling you what it says. Okay, maybe I can put it up here. I hate the way that looks. So this little piece is our p-value is less than 0.1%. Because it's just from here on in. OK? Do you understand that? That's what we've been doing all along. These p-values, I hope the one thing that you learn from this course, if you just learn one thing, which is actually an improvement, sometimes they say that after taking a stats class, any stats class, people learn less because they're common sense. They don't trust their common sense, which really does give you some foundation. So if you give them the same test before and afterwards on just sort of ordinary everyday events, things which would, we really want you to think statistically about, generally speaking, people do worse, which is horrible to think about. I know, it's terrible. You'll do better at like fancy calculations and you can do certain tasks. But if you just have an ordinary everyday problem, you often do worse because you don't trust your intuition anymore. You learn to think in a way that's not connected to your intuition. So the one thing I just hopefully, and since p-values are something hardly anybody understands, and they come up over and over and over and over again, and you're going to read all this stuff about p-hacking and reverse p-hacking, everything. If you just think back to what we do, You'll understand p-values, and that is my goal. And you'll be better off than most people who actually are in the field. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I mean actually publish papers. I mean, and use this stuff. So that's my one goal. That's why I keep drawing these pictures, keep saying what the null is, keep trying to get you to understand what we're talking about here. You know. 
So this right here, this tiny little probability, is the probability that if this model was completely empty, that we'd do just as well if we wanted to predict the probability of somebody getting in, not thinking about their biological science score, not thinking about their gender, just thinking about the percent of people who got in, the average percent who got in in this data set. That's what, you know, our intercept here once, this is for the log odds, but once you exponentiate it and once you change it to a probability, then that's, that's just as good as including this stuff in the model, right? That's what our null is. And if we do, did that, if we had nothing in our model, the chance that we'd get this kind of evidence for the validity of this model, this kind of evidence, this, this p-value, if this was true, is so tiny that we have to say at some point, hey, we reject that. We reject it. Because it's just such an unlikely thing to have happened to get that big a p-value. So it doesn't mean that we can accept our model. It doesn't mean that. It just means that um, we, the likelihood of getting this is so tiny that we reject it. We, you know, and we don't mean that this particular model, we have to go further to analyze this particular model. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to look at these t the slopes. They both look significant here. So to test whether the individual slopes are significant, how did they arrive at these? We did z test. So we'll state the null and alternative for each slope and calculate the z. It's already done for you. And then we're just going to put confidence intervals around these estimates. All right. It's already done for you. I just want to show you how it was gotten. It's our usual way. So what are we testing here? Gender. So to test gender, the null is that it's just 0, right? that it's zero. And the alternative is what? That, do you think we should do one-sided or two-sided for this? One-sided or two-sided? I mean, did you have any prior knowledge, really? I mean, I had a prejudice, I mean, I had a feeling that women were going to, it was going to be harder for them to get in, but I didn't really have any, I think it's two-sided. I was very surprised by this data. I didn't have a belief that um, men were getting discriminated against at all, if anything, the opposite. So I would have done a two-sided. A two-sided alternative. Does that make sense? Because we had no, because we didn't know who was favored. Okay, so we do the two-sided, and we say the z, as usual, is our observed slope minus our expected over the typical slope, we see, standard error of the slope. And this is our observed slope right here. We're looking at this one, 2.015 minus 0, that's our expected, over our standard error, and we don't have these standard error, we just have the regular standard error here. 0 0.8579, that's what we're doing, and that is equal to 2.35. I rounded when I did it, 2.348 they got. Okay, so we would just draw this curve here, and when the null is true, we'd expect to get a z-score of 0, right, that's as a z-score, also, we'd expect to get a slope of 0, and we just wanted to see where the slope of 2.015 landed. And it turns out it lands really pretty far out on the z as z equals 2.015, and that's where our slope of 2.35 was. All right, and so here's negative 2.105, so it could... We're doing two-sided. We didn't know which way it was going to go, so we're looking at the area of both these tails. So you get, um, oops, I did this all wrong. I'm so sorry. You should have caught me. Look how I switched that. Z is 2.35 and negative 2.35. And it's our slope here that's 2.015. 
Okay, sorry about that. So um, we have to look that up, 2.35, and we will. And we get 98.12 in the middle, so it's just our usual. So it's just our p-value is 100 minus 98.12, which is 1.88%. And how does it compare? It's almost the same thing. I rounded up a little bit, so that's why that's down a little. Okay, so that's good. These, by the way, are both two-sided. They're significant, and they're both two-sided. Most data programs run two-sided tests. That's usually the default. Now, how about for the other one? For, um, let's think about it. For the biological science score. All right, the beta for that. So we're looking, we're testing whether the, um, in the population, the null is for the biological science score that it's zero even though in our model we got this. So, and so the alternative here would be what? They ran a two-sided test, but I would run a one-sided. I would think of it as a one-sided because do you really think that it would, well, I don't know. It might, we could, we could do, it's kind of complicated in multiple regression, so if you want, we could do we could do a two-sided. But there's a good argument that you might, in a simple regression, you would definitely think that um, it was going to be greater than zero. What would it mean if it went down to negative? What would it mean? It would mean that if you compared people of the same gender no it could I don't see how can you th can you think of a reasonable explanation for doing a two-sided it would mean that if you compared people of the same gender that it would be better to have a lower biological science score do you think we should do a two-sided do you think it would really be better to have a lower in any scenario, comparing every, you know, two people, I don't think so. I'm going to go with this. I think, I can't imagine being on a medical school admissions committee and saying, oh, we have two people. Everything else looks the same here. It's better to have a lower. It doesn't make sense so much, does it? So I'm going to keep with the one-sided here. So we do the same thing, and we'd say what? Z equals our observed slope from our models, 1.6 minus our expected zero over our standard error. I'm just looking at this. I'm just getting the same stuff here. Okay, and that is 0 0.4629 and 3.586. And um, I would get, if I did this one-sided, um, you know, I'd just look at one tail. And um, do you, I don't have to do this out, right? You don't want, do you need to see me? Do you want to see this actually work? Do you want to see the, me get the uh, middle area for that and everything or not? You don't need to, do you? So um, I'll just tell you what I got. So the p-value would be equal to half of the other one, 0.015% because it's one-sided. This is twice that. Okay, so um, I think that's pretty much it. And why don't we just look at confidence intervals now. So the computer gave us confidence intervals. How did they arrive at that? This is very, very easy for you to do because we've, we do the same two-step process that we did when we did uh, transformations. So we'll build confidence intervals for the slopes the usual way, right? Um, so for the slopes in the log odds equation, what are we doing here? Um, so the confidence interval for the slopes do not contain zero. Do you see that? 
They don't contain zero. So this is equivalent to a two-sided z-test giving a p-value what? Let's just think about this. We've done this many times before. So we have 95% confidence interval. We're doing z-test, so 95% in the middle. If our confidence intervals don't contain zero, that means we landed either, well, in this case, we, we landed here or here. In this case, we landed here. But if they don't contain zero, so isn't it the same as a two? So that's 2.5% and 2.5%. So together, that's 5%. This statement is equivalent to this. Now, to build confidence intervals, we're going to do that two-step procedure. All right? So we have to do this. We're going to find the endpoints of the confidence intervals for the slope and the log odds, and then we're going to exponentiate each endpoint to get the slope for the odds ratio, for the odds ratio. All right, so let's do this. So our first step is 95% confidence interval for the slope and the log odds. And so we're just doing this. It's the sample slope, 2.015. Um, plus or minus the critical value of z, and it's given to you right there, they're using 1.96, times the standard error. So you then get this interval here by subtracting 1.96 from subtracting and adding to that. So we get this. and it doesn't contain zero. All right, now our next step to get the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio, what are we going to do? So for the odds ratio, we can't just say e to the slope plus or minus that because we have to take, we're going to have to exponentiate the endpoints. This, we did this, this is identical to what we did when we did a log transform, because that's all we're doing, is we're anti-logging. And we get 1.4 to 40.29. That's what I got. So that means we're 95% sure that the odds for females getting to med school in this model are between 1.4 to 40.29 times greater than the odds of males getting in. And if you want to check it, how would you check it? Remember, our, if you want to check it, you would take this, it's the geometric mean. So you check that if you took the square root and multiplied the square root of 1.4 times 40.29, take their geometric mean, not their arithmetic mean. That's going to be the odds ratio. That will give you e to the um, 2.015 which is equal to, it should give you about, within rounding error, 7.5. Okay, we went through the reasoning behind that. It's just arithmetic. Okay, now um, let's do the same thing for the biological science score. It's exactly the same. So you're just going to take this, 1.66 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.4629. You can check that you get exactly what they got here. And then you're just going to exponentiate the endpoints. So it's just what we've done before. All right. And so, so we're just going to say E to I got 2.12 to 13.03. Okay.
It's just, you can see it right here. It's just because you're adding and subtracting e to the same amount. So it's going to cancel out, and you're just going to get, um, you know, the square root of e to the 1.66 times e to the 1.66. All right, so let's do that check again. Check that if you square root those, you will get your odds ratio. Check. Is that equal to the odds ratio? which is equal to e to the 1.66. And it does. Both of these check out. OK, so now what are we saying? So the odds ratio confidence intervals not containing what is equivalent. We saw that these slopes don't contain 0. And we said that's equivalent to a two-tailed z test. And so it's also equivalent to what? Um, if the slope. If the slope in the log odds equation, if that confidence interval does not contain 0, then when we exponentiate to get the odds ratio, the odds ratio confidence interval does not contain, we're just, this is a log odds, so we're just taking anti-logging, so it does not contain exponent e to the 0, which is 1. So that's the same thing. It just means that um, it's not 50-50 odds. It's not, um, you know, that 1, it's just all this. It means you have some kind of. Uh, Like for gender, it means when it doesn't contain, the log odds doesn't t contain 0, that means that there's, it's not 1 to 1 odds. It's not a 50-50 chance between males and females. It's not, there's some, one is favored over the other. Okay, so I think, is that it? Yes, we are done. And of course, read this summary as always and do the homework, and then we are done with uh, this section. And all we have left is a non-parametric stats, and we are going to be done with the class. So this exam three should be very doable, uh, the, co the uh, final, because it's just going to cover uh, the transformation of variables on, right? Oh, the randomization test on, so part eight on. Part 13 on. Okay, so that's it, and um, have a great weekend.